Hey, you can find a seat this morning. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Hey, you are fully caffeinated. Let me uh, say, as Ron said at the beginning, we're so thankful that you're here this morning, and it is a privilege to be able to worship as God's people. And I hope that you've been encouraged already this morning as we've turned our attention to Christ. Are you thankful this morning that the tomb is empty and that we have a living hope as God's people? Amen. Amen. And so, so many good things that we've already reflected on. It was amazing. I don't know. I hope you were paying careful attention to what you were singing, uh, but to reflect on God's grace to us, to think uh, about that death has been defeated, that Christ has died for sinners. Um, boy, I, sometimes I think, Ryan, we could just keep on singing, right? Uh, it was so good, just good for my soul this morning. Very, very thankful. So thanks for the worship team and all that they do uh, just to lead us well. I hope that you're encouraged by that. Uh, we believe that every time we come together on Sunday morning that as God's people, we are to uh, increasingly adore our Christ and reflect back to him the glory that he alone deserves. And so we get to do that. So our attention is, is on God's word. But today is a little bit different. Some of you know that we have been walking through the book of Romans, and I promise you that the book of Romans is going to lead us long into 2024. But today, because, but because of God's uh, kindness and his providence, today we have the privilege to launch over the next couple of weeks, uh, really our, our campaign, our generosity campaign. And you're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Uh, but for some of those that have been with us for a while, you know that God has been kind to us to allow us in his grace to have now a permanent location as Hope Church. And yeah, you can clap about that. Yeah, yeah, all right. So... We have been nomads for a while. Uh, we are four plus years in as a church, two years before that as a campus, and uh, you'll hear this again a little bit later, but we actually have four different mailing addresses. And so uh, I think Ryan and I are looking forward to one location where there's one spot where mail is actually sent. Amazon drivers have no clue. They think, man, you guys have already launched out into four churches. And so, uh, but nonetheless, what we want to do though is uh, as we've been praying about this, is thinking about God's kindness to us as a church, uh, we really believe and want to make sure that we're very clear as we move forward that this transition to 3001 Mounds Road is not about brick and mortar. Um, now, I know it's very careful for us to get caught up in those things, and so what we want to do is, over the next couple of weeks, anchor ourselves in God's Word to go beyond a particular location, but to think about what God's called us to. And so we as elders want to make sure that we do a good job shepherding us over the next few, uh, few weeks and then jump back into Romans. So I want you to meet me in Ephesians chapter 3. I've been staring long and hard at this particular passage to sort of help us understand that, um, that this is not just some cliche or uh, just some uh, superficial attempt that we're uh, making as we think about transitioning and just hopefully in a few months to a new location. But I am so thankful as I have reflected over the last, uh, really uh, all of my ministry, but also particularly the, the part of Hope Church, that God has been faithful to us at every step of the way. And when I say that, it goes beyond locations, but it actually goes to, to ministry, to how we have been able to partner together to, to proclaim Christ and to make disciples. And I just want to commend you at the very beginning and say thank you for your partnership. Uh, it is not lost on the elders that we get to do this as part of the body of Christ. That there is no JV team. Amen. Uh, that as God's people right here in Anderson, that we get to do this together. And I don't know about you, but that just thrills my soul what God does. Uh, from the vantage point that goes beyond what we do even in worship to just being bought the body of Christ and doing so many things. So I'm thankful for you. I'm also, again, thankful that... Four years, God has been faithful to us. But I want to remind you at the beginning, before we look at this passage, that our mission as a church has not changed, nor does it change, when we move about a mile and a half north. Uh, our mission is something that we want to be laser-focused on. Uh, that uh, Some people say, well, you know, it's opportunity, God's been kind, you can sort of settle into a new location renovate a facility that will serve our needs, serve opportunities. And again, you may hear some repetition in this ser sermon, but let me go ahead and say it at the beginning. Uh, it's very clear to me that we are not renovating and updating a retirement home or a community center. We are upgrading a battleship for ministry. Um, I want to say that again. <laughs> we are updating a battleship for gospel ministry in this community. And we hope that you share that vision. 
Um, and so uh, I remember when we were thinking about launching Hope Church and we were going, like, what do we do? And we'd have meetings where people would come and, you know, have interest meetings. What, what are you about? What do you believe? Great question. What are you going to do? Which sometimes I hate that question. But nonetheless, uh, I said, if you're not interested in building something, this is probably not for you. And I think that when you think about discipleship and the Great Commission, there must be a gas down excitement and even partnership about, hey, God has saved me and redeemed me. I'm no longer who I used to be, and now I want to invest the gospel in the lives of other people. And so our mission is to make disciples of our neighbors and the nations. Uh, We tried to boil it down into that, make disciples of our neighbors and the nations, and we want to make sure that we keep that focus as long as God gives us breath. Amen. And so why Ephesians 3? Why Ephesians 3? Uh, Again, our normal pattern, if you're new or newer, is to walk systematically through the books of the Bible. So just to pick a text and just download it is not our uh, bread and butter. It's not normal, but it does have sufficiency, and I think it's important this morning. So I want us to stare for just a few moments at two verses, which the broader concept is Paul is in the book of Ephesians. You have the first three chapters that are glorious doctrinal truth, theology on fire is the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. All of a sudden, in chapter 4, Paul turns to being very practical. And what he means, or what, what's happening in the logic of the letter is, if you really believe these things, chapters 1 through 3, then, and if they are part of your life, then chapter 4 makes sense on how you live it out, right? It's chapter 4 through. But interestingly, at the end of 3, Paul prays for the church at Ephesus. And in this prayer, again, he's very personal, but there's a lot of things that he teaches us that I think we need to consider as we begin to think about moving forward as God's people, as Hope Church. Listen to what Paul says at the conclusion of his prayer. It's what's termed a doxology. It's almost as if he's taken up in worship. And he says, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, According to the power at work within us, and then verse 20, he repeats the, the, the to him, to him be glory, now notice, in the church and in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again, in the church and in Christ Jesus, and then he gives a timeline, throughout all generations, forever and a- ever, amen. Paul concludes this wonderful prayer for the church at Ephesus because he realizes that at part of what's at central, what's at stake, is how is it that the kingdom is going to advance? How is it that the gospel is going to continue to work in Ephesus and in the known world at this point in time? Paul understands that the church is central to this strategy of the gospel expanding. So I want to make quickly four observations from this text that I hope thrill your soul. And one would be a challenge to all of us to consider, okay, where do we fit when we see this doxology, what Paul's praying here? The first thing that I want us to observe is simply this, that in Paul's prayer, there's an undertone and an understanding that God can and does answer his people's prayers. Let me say that again. There is, to not miss the the big E on the eye chart, when Paul is praying this, if you actually go back up into verse 14, we're not going to read it, he sort of starts his prayer in verse 14, and it's laden with he, he desires to see God's power on display in the people of Ephesus. He wants to see love on display in the people of Ephesus. He wants to see wisdom at work in the people of Ephesus. You can go home and check my homework, okay? From verses 14 and on, God is pleading, excuse me, Paul is pleading with the Father that that would be a reality in the life of the church at Ephesus. And then he concludes this with his grand doxology. He's taken up in worship. He says, to him, to him be glory. But there is an assumption that is a right assumption theologically, is that Paul knew, and we should understand, that God does answer his people's prayers, right? And so we should relish in that. I mean, does it not blow your mind that we have a heavenly father who hears the prayers of his people and according to his sovereign good pleasure answers our prayers? Now, We have to be careful here, right? There's a lot of theological error around this. Like, well, I can pray anything that I want to pray, and then God is my uh, glorified bellhop, and he's supposed to do what I want him to do. No, God's people always submit their requests to his sovereignty, right? We are always understanding that our heavenly Father knows best, but how kind of God along the way to answer our prayers. I'll never forget years and years ago, 
when the kids were little, we're walking around Shadyside Park. How many of you know Shadyside, right? Some of the folks who are new to Anderson or whatever, you need to find Shadyside. It's a good place to walk uh, in the evening. Don't walk alone, okay? But nonetheless, <laughs> we're walking around Shadyside. The kids, the boys were little, and there was a huge crane, right? That We see it on the lake. I see it. Aaron sees it. Ellie's not along yet. It's Luke and Aaron. And we see it, and, I, and Luke doesn't see it. And so Aaron, we're all excited about this, and we're walking on. Luke's crying. He's not in here, so I can throw him under the bus. So, and then I'm like, so Krista's like, well, let's pray that we would see another one before it's over. And here I am. I'm, I'm like the pastor, right? I'll be honest with you. I sometimes there's skepticism in my heart. Honestly, I'm like, oh, come on. That's not going to work. So we literally walk and we pray, knowing God's not obligated He's not obligated. I think Krista prayed. I think I was not praying. <laughs> and then just a few minutes later, guess what? A crane. Luke's eyes, he, he dried up. He was excited. I know it seems minuscule and minor, and there are much bigger things to pray for in the world. But I want to remind you, please hear me. Hold on. Hold fast. God answers the prayers of his people. Sometimes, obviously, not the way we want it to be answered. But he answers the prayers of his people. You know, we've talked a lot about, you know, I remember we were in the Carolina, you know, schools out of prayer. You know, they've taken prayer out of schools and everybody's all up in arms. And I'm like, I wonder if, if we're even praying in our homes. The simple fact that I want to encourage you this morning is to know that God answers his prayers. Well, how does that connect to our story? How does that connect to Hope Church? How does that connect to moving forward? <laughs> right? Because, again, this is not about brick and mortar. Here's the thing. I have heard some of your prayers. You have heard each other pray. You've prayed for lost people. You've prayed for Hope Church. You've prayed for each other. You've prayed specifically for things in the life of family and friends that are sitting right here in this room. I've heard you pray. You have prayed for each other. And how beautiful along the way that your prayers, my prayers, under God's sovereign good pleasure have been answered at times. God answers the prayer of his people. This is what not only is assumed in this text, but must be understood rightly. That Paul knew the link between power and wisdom and love was God's people praying. God answers now to him. Notice, So that's the first observation. Secondly... Here's the beautiful part. God can and often does exceed our expectations. Notice what he says. Now to him who is able to do, now here it is, far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. According, and then he qualifies it according to the power that is work within us. The NIV translates this immeasurably more. It's what, uh, what scholars say, the, the phrase, see it, able to do far more abundantly, far more abundantly, is what's called the super superlative that Paul uses. Um, and I'm not an English guy, but what I would tell you is that Paul in his doxology, praying for the Ephesians, knows and wants them to know that God can and does often exceed our expectations. We just need to be the type of people who have spiritual eyes to see it, to, to open our eyes and see, listen, that God is not dead in some distant deity up in the sky removed from the world and world events and from your life. That God is at work. God is working. Do you see God working in and around you? Force yourself, discipline yourself to open your eyes and see good and beautiful things. Trust me, the world will throw you enough bad things. Don't get sucked down the rabbit hole, but open your eyes and see the beauty of, of what God is doing. And know this, God often and can does exceed his ex, the expectations of his people. Amen. That's what Paul, Paul is actually praying to, that we would understand that it is his power on display, not us. I love the part this morning that we were seeing that it's in our weakness. You remember that? It's in our weakness that God's power is made perfect. And so God does often exceed our expectations. So we don't spin out of control here, right? We don't spin out of control. We are always submissive servants to what God chooses to do. 
But I think this calls into question, do you believe that God can exceed your expectations at times? Or have you become so skeptical and doubtful that you don't believe that he can save your, your family member? That he won't, can't change your marriage? I think the church, so easy for us to gather on Sunday, but to know that part of our problem is, is that we, we doubt this is why we always have to be pointed to the gospel outside of ourselves. God can and often does exceed our expectations. Quickly, though, we have to see, though, in this doxology, not only does he answer the prayers of his people and often exceed our expectations, but number three, God in Christ deserves our highest praise and devotion. This is really the key, I think, that we have to see in this prayer, in this conclusion. Notice two times he repeats this phrase. Now, to him, you see that at the beginning of verse 20? And then look at verse 21. To him be glory. Do you see that? It's easy when you think about spiritual things and spiritual fruit and praying for things to happen. There can be a danger for us to, to say, well, okay, to almost idolize those things and make it about us, right? Let's say that there's things that are happening. Uh, there, there are good things that are happening. We were, I was talking to some people this week about even success in ministry, that there is danger when it comes to even spiritual things that are happening. And I think what Paul knows is that in this concluding prayer, that he actually wants to see, again, wisdom at work at Ephesus. He wants to see love at work at Ephesus. He wants to see power at work at Ephesus. But he wants all of the glory and praise to go to the right person. To him alone be glory. The psalmist would say, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name alone we give glory. In our hyper-sensational celebrity culture, it's very easy to take the focus off of King Jesus. And I think what we need to be reminded of is that we are weak, sinful, needy people. And what Paul teaches us in this prayer, he repeats it, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to him alone be glory. Do you realize that's what we get to do? We get to give Christ glory, our highest praise and our highest devotion. That's what we do. That's the third observation. And then number four, this is where I think it connects well to us as a church. Notice this observation. God's glory is made visible in and through his church and Christ. Notice what he says. So where is the location? It's the, the locative case is used here, and it's so important. Where does this glory show up? It, shows, it should show up. He's praying that it shows up in the church. Do you see that? And interestingly, he links, and in Christ Jesus... Throughout all generations, forever and ever. I don't know about you, but as God's people, we should be promoting the church. I don't know how, uh, how you can read both the New Testament, the Bible, and walk away and think that the church is inconsequential to the glory of God. It is not inconsequential. It is not tangential to your life. The church is where God's glory is to be put on display. How kind of God, right? It's interesting the link that he makes between Christ and the church and the way that he has assumed or notes that this is an inseparable link. Now think about that for just a moment. The link between the church and Christ is interwoven in Paul's logic in his prayer. It's not something that he detaches. As a matter of fact, if you read all of the letter of the book of Ephesians, Paul is really high on the church. He's really excited about the church. As a matter of fact, in this book, he uses multiple metaphors and titles and images to drive home the fact that the church is not something that we came up with. It's actually God's strategy and design for his glory. How many of you remember going from, this is to date myself, how many of you are going from analog TV to digital TV? I was like, man, you can see, you can see the athlete's nose hairs. <laughs> I was a little curt, but nonetheless. 
And I know the church is battered and bruised. She's always in need of transformation and reformation. We do live between the two advents of Christ. And by the way, there is no perfect church. And if you're looking for one here, you're not going to find it. But what I will tell you, theologically, biblically, and without a shadow of a doubt, at the very center of proper understanding of God's word and the gospel stands and sits and bows people who are filled by his spirit, who are grace-laden people who have been transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. The church stands at the very center. It is his strategy to display his power, his wisdom, and his love. There's different images. You can go back and pick this up throughout the book of Ephesians. How does Paul emphasize the church throughout the letter? At the very opening, he uses terms like saints in Ephesus. In chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, he uses the imagery of the body of Christ, where Christ is the head of the church. Amen? In chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, he gives this beautiful understanding that that the church is a new community of reconciled strangers and enemies, that both Jew and Gentile serve the same Christ, have the same identity, and can sit together in worship. Amen. Amen? New identity. Strangers and enemies have been reconciled. In chapter 2, verse 19, he gives us the image that what's happening right here in the local church is that there is a new citizenship on display. We fly, if you want to know the flag that we fly, it's the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. We are a new citizen. We are a new kingdom. New citizens made up of every tribe and tongue. In chapter 2, verse 19, he says another image, that we are a family. One of the most endearing terms in the New Testament for Christians is brother and sister. Brother and sister. Who don't, not like ships passing in the night, no, Something has happened, and we have a link. Brothers and sisters. What a beautiful term. And then he concludes chapter 2 by giving us another image that the church is the temple of the Lord where his Holy Spirit resides. And so to think in terms of the gospel message and to think in terms of our salvation is to actually begin to think rightly about his church and, I would add, our role within the life of the church. One of the things that all you can go home and read these metaphors, I, I, these images, these titles, they're beautiful. And to walk away and be disappointed about the church is a wrong conclusion. To actually be excited. What Paul is basically saying is that these images all throughout the book of Ephesus magnify the beauty of Jesus' church. This is why Paul's prayer makes sense, doesn't it, Right? Why would Paul pray, notice, verse 21, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever? Because it is God's strategy to display his glory to the world. This is why it's so important that we are a new community of reconciled sinners and that the concrete display of power and grace and wisdom is through his people, through his people. Paul understood the good news of Jesus creates a gathering of grace-filled brothers and sisters who worship and witness for Jesus. I like what Ray Ortland has recently said, this should be behind me, about the church. He said, Jesus did not come into this world to merely start a new community. In a world of grandiosity and brutality, Jesus gave his lifeblood to start a community set apart by beauty, his own beauty. It is here where Jesus is, listen, welcoming the poor in spirit. He looks past the big shots, the heavy hitters, the insiders, the cool kids, and the ones who have all the answers. I added that. (laughs) He looks to the poor who have nothing to offer him, nothing to boast about, nothing but need. These are the very ones he rejoices over and welcomes in and enriches as heirs of the kingdom. In this new community, we don't bring our strengths. We bring our needs. It is this surprising strategy, the church, how beauty enters the world of ugliness. To love Jesus and be down on his bride, hear me, is a theological fallacy. It is a fallacy. To love Jesus and treat the church as something that is just you get your spiritual fix on the weekend and that's it, is a misreading of 
all the Bible. The beauty of the church. You see, we don't give up on the church because she's still being formed. Let me remind you, we need to be in each other's corner because we are still a work in progress. And we should find that type of grace and encouragement in the church. But just because we struggle, we don't give up on the church. Rather, we embrace the church as glorious and consequential to the advancement of the kingdom. Look at what he says. To him, Jesus, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so what does that bring us to? Why is this text so important for me to help us as we navigate the next couple of weeks? Because over the last 20 minutes, I have said absolutely nothing about 3001 Mounds Road. Okay, now you're like, okay, but now you're going to, right? (laughs) Because God has been kind to us to establish us and to keep us as his own. And so I hope that you feel the privilege. So what does this, here it is. What does this move do? Or what do we want this move to do? Let me give you three things. Oh, by the way, before I forget, we've put it in a very pretty brochure for you, okay? So if you're like, that guy talks way too fast, we slowed it down on paper and we put it out there on the connect desk for you. But three things that I hope that you share excitement in, regardless of location. Amen? Number one, that we would see this move and any move that we make as an opportunity to fuel disciple making. Matthew 28, and we're not going to read it, but many of you have been around the church a long time, and it seems we don't want to use Matthew 28 as a crutch, but we also understand that Jesus gave us the Great Commission. We want to see this move to 3001 help us fuel disciple making in the life of our church where you and I take increasing ownership of one another for the glory of God. Um, Do you sense your need to be discipled and to continue discipling? We want to see this as a challenge to all of us to take the Great Commission more seriously. I think about weekly worship gatherings where, listen, where Sunday in, Sunday out, we get to open God's Word together. To be formed by his word is a privilege. Amen? And to have a high view of the Lord's day. Where God's word, again, is not something that, again, I know today, but we don't just jump from place to place. We don't treat it like a trampoline. We dive into the the depths and we go through God's word. Uh Uh-oh. And we deal with what God's word deals with. So, the book of Romans. Weekly worship gatherings. I think about... Fueling disciple-making in regards to strengthening and encouraging our families, our singles, and our marriages. It is not lost on me that right here in this room, everyone under the sound of my voice needs godly encouragement and help along the way. And I'm not talking about just some quick fix. But we need to have in our mind, downloaded it in our heart, that we partner together and we... The Hebrew writer, like Hebrews was written to help people get all the way home. If Hebrews was written to get all the way, people all the way home, then the church must take up that same passion. That we, that, that we are all in need. That this is a safe place to repent, confess, and grow. Amen? Amen. Let me say it again. It is a safe place to repent, confess, and grow. That you would actually lean into that to strengthen singles and marriages and families. And then thirdly, to fuel disciple making, that this would be a move to help us continue to invest in our kids and students. If you are a parent, we want you to know something. We are committed to the best of our ability to help you point your kids to Jesus. Let me say that again. To the best of our ability... We want to see the little ones that are a part of our church be pointed to Jesus Christ. And we want to help you do that. We want to teach them the word. We want to support you as the primary disciples because we know, mom and dad, it is war. It is war. All out war. And we want, listen, we don't expect perfect parents. 
because I can promise you, don't look at me. <laughs> but what we do want to expect is a gospel passion in our parenting. And that we need each other. Listen, this is where all of us come to play. It doesn't matter if your kids are gone or if you have grandkids. Listen, every age matters in this church. But particularly to parents, we want to be a place that helps and supports you. We want to be a strong partner in the ministry of church, of our church. And please hear me, where you actually see integrating your family into the rib rhythms and fabric of the local church is a beautiful thing. Let me say that again. Where you integrating your family into the life of the local church is a beautiful thing. And it ought to be an oddity when that doesn't happen. I was thinking this week, man, there were not a lot of options in the ancient world. There was, there was a church. And I would just say it ought to increasingly be odd when as families... We don't integrate our families into the life of the local church. We want this to be a place where discipleship is not a cliche, but it really matters. Secondly, we want this move to fuel discipleship. Secondly, we want this move to help us reach our neighbors. Luke 14, 23 is a great parable where you have the master having the servant go invite people into the banquet. This is a paraphrase. And one of the things that the servant runs into is excuse after excuse after excuse. And what the master does in response to the, the ones who wouldn't come is he, the master tells the servant, well, go into the highway and hedges and compel the needy to come in and basically done. Be a part, fill the house is the phrase that's used. It's an image that teaches us simply this. Let me boil it down to you. That we must be that we are beggars telling other beggars where to get eternal food. Let me say that again. We, as God's people at Hope, are beggars who have eternal bread, who are telling people who don't even know, right? But they need to know that there is eternal life in Jesus. So part of this transition is to help us fuel that mission. And I'll tell you, I think we're weak here. I think we're weak on understanding. I'll be the first to admit that Reaching our neighbors is something that we have to pray and consider as part of God's people. God is faithful, but just because he's faithful and sovereign doesn't give us a pass to neglect what God's called us to do. We have to understand that we are called to reach our neighbors, that we would be challenged and take up the challenge to be equipped to live on mission. Where when we drive off this property or that property, we remember that we represent, hear me, we represent Christ and we are missionaries to our community. That there would be no mission drift. No mission drift. I mean, think about it. Who told you about Jesus? Are you thankful for that person? Are you thankful for that church that upheld the, the proclamation of the gospel? Then we want to be that same type of church for people. Think about this, challenge and equip. Think about even more capacity to assimilate new disciples into the life of the church. Because if God grants growth, if God grants growth, we are responsible to disciple and help each other be matured. This is important. Thirdly, that we would think about this is a permanent location to invite people and welcome people who need to hear the gospel and need godly relationships. One address, as I said, to get mail instead of four. That's pretty practical. But, but I think about it this way. A ministry center, a place to pray, strategize, encourage, share, use for his glory. Four plus acres in a city of 55,000 people in a county of 100, 130,000 people. A place that has deep and complex needs. A ministry center to help us reach our neighbors. We know the powers in the gospel but let's use any location to proclaim the gospel. Amen? Thirdly, quickly, we hope this move helps us multiply our impact. Three quick things here. I think about 2 Timothy, if you think about texts that flood my soul. 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, entrust to faithful men also. When you, when you think about gospel ministry, even we sing, how many of you remember singing earlier, teach us to what? Number our days, O oh Lord, that we might get a heart of wisdom. I'm keenly aware that if God allows Hope Church to have decades, some of you, and let's just say, I'm going to say, how old am I? 
let's say four decades, all right? I'm probably after four decades, either I'm gone or I'm close to being gone. Maybe three, I don't know. You get my point, is that there should be, even Paul's prayer, notice that throughout all the generations forever and ever, amen. I wonder what type of legacy we will leave behind. A place to multiply impact, a place to train future pastors, leaders, disciple makers. You see, we must be willing to sacrifice to ensure that the local church takes a priority, takes it back, takes back the priority of both calling, confirming, and preparing pastors and leaders for future advancement of the gospel. Some of you need to be those future leaders. Some of you need to not sit on the sidelines and be an observer from afar, but be engaged in leadership development and giving and serving and sacrificing. We see this as an opportunity to advance that. I will tell you that that's a struggle, but it is important. Multiplying our impact, a place to launch and invest new church planners and churches that we would be ascending people. And then I think about, too, even how our move moving forward reminds us about the importance of even having a global impact. Do you know that a number of our global partners are praying for us? One of the things that in our relationships, as we've developed relationships with our global partners, is a lot of times international missions is sort of one way, right? It's we, the American Western church, providing spiritual help, finances. But one of the things that we've talked about in our global partnership is, hey, we are in need. We have a mission field. Pray for us. Our global partners are praying for you, praying for us on how we could do better in evangelism, how we could disciple better. I think about this interconnectedness of our impact that, that it's not just about our own community, but it has a global opportunity as well. And so in essence, here's, here's how we wrap this first one up. What are we asking? We're simply asking you to be engaged in this season of transition. To lean in, to pray, to think about your part in the story and actually embrace this, this mission with joy. To embrace this mission with joy. Why should we do this? Why should we do this? Let me just simply say because Christ died and rose again to save us from our sins. And he has placed us in a beautiful community that is full of his blessing and his mission is undeniable. Do you believe that? His mission is undeniable. Listen to this, this prayer in conclusion. Maybe this should be our prayer throughout the whole time together. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Hey, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that along the way, that God, in your kindness, someone shared the gospel with us. Someone took your word and invested your word in us. And God, we are so thankful for that. And so, Lord, as we, as we come now to this opportunity, to this privilege, to think about how you have been faithful over four years in the life of our church family, we just want to, first of all, just say thank you. Thank you, God, that you are building your church across the world and we get to be a part of it. And so, Lord, we pray that as we move forward that you would be honored, that not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name alone we would give you glory. And so, God, would you help us in these moments as we think about our part in the story of how we can be engaged. And so, Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray, God, that you would apply your word to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we're finished this morning, how fitting it is for us to take the table together. You know, I was thinking this morning about, you know, and over the last few weeks, how do we start? Where do we start? Ephesians 3 is where I landed. But just as a brother and as a fellow Christian, I want to remind you that, that our greatest privilege in this life is to know Christ and to worship Him forever. <clears throat> how fitting for us in this service to conclude our time taking the Lord's Supper together. You know, at the center of, of our life, at the center of God's Word, stands the cross of Christ. And I think about as we move forward, I think about my own life, I think about my family, I think about ministry. 
I want us to actually be thrilled that we're no longer alienated or exiles. That I actually want in my affections and in yours to have a joy that, that is like a tidal wave because you realize that the blood of Christ is the one thing that reconciles you as a sinner to holiness, to God. And so as we think about that, what else does Paul teach us about the table that makes sense to moving forward? Is that every time we take the table, that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. This is what Paul would tell the church at Ephesus. As these brothers pass out the elements this morning, they're going to go ahead and come through. It's not only an opportunity for you to be grateful, but it's also an opportunity for us as a church to remember that what do we do together? In in just a moment when we take this, you are shouting to each other and you're shouting to the world that Christ died for sinners. Are you thankful that there is forgiving grace in Jesus? Amen? And so I want us to listen, remain seated as they pass them out, but I want you to listen to this song. I'll come back in just a moment and give us some further instructions.